and welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Saif Coleman. I am the Executive Director for Asheville Writers in the Schools and Community. We are a local nonprofit that is dedicated to igniting social change through the power of arts, culture, and restorative self-expression. And I'm also the moderator for today's panelists. This is the final part of the 2020 um, Asheville Protest Murals Virtual Exhibition. Um, and the Asheville Arts Area Arts Council has been having a three-part speaker series. If you're interested in viewing the exhibition and the videos uh, to all three of the events, you can visit AshevilleArts.com slash protest to check it out. Before we get into everything, we just want to uh, do a little bit of housekeeping, uh, starting off by thanking our sponsors who made this uh, all possible. That includes Dogwood Health Trust, the Asheville Area Arts Council, the Martin Luther King Jr. Association of Asheville and Buncombe County, and Equity Over Everything. We really appreciate the support for making this possible. Um, and again, if you have any questions for the panelists today, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll do the best that we can to get to them at the end of today's panel. So today we're gonna to be talking about the, uh, public art, but before we get into that, we thought it would probably be a good idea to define what exactly is public art? We've been talking about it for the last uh, couple of sessions and then realized no one really sort of came out and said, hey, by the way, in case you're unaware, this is public art and this is what it looks like. Um, and as the slide says, quite simply, um, it's art, you know, public art in public spaces. Um, it can come in a variety of forms, uh, sizes and scales, um, but it usually is just a way to make art more accessible to a larger segment of the popular uh, population. So rather than it being in a gallery or tucked away in someone's home, it's in a public space and it often encourages interaction um, at the very least and usually always encourages thought um, and different forms of engagement. Um, so with that in mind, we thought it would be good to take a look at some different examples of public art uh, both locally and around the state and country. So those in Nashville may be familiar with the mural that's in Triangle Park. Uh, this is located uh, downtown um, in a historic area that's also known as the Block, which was the um, business district for the African-American community here in Nashville for quite a long time. Um, and this mural depicts um, scenes and individuals who are relevant to Asheville's Black history. Um, another uh, local piece uh, is called Hope Springs Forth Brightly. Um, and this was a piece that was done a couple of years ago um, by art ecology, as well as local artist, Joseph Pearson, who's an, uh, um, a painter and illustrator, and Phyllis Utley, who uh, among many things is also a, a poet. Um, and this was a great piece that brought together many art forms and uh, lots of input from the public to put together this piece that celebrates the, the work and the, um, and the life lived experience of African-Americans here in Asheville. Uh, in addition to some local pieces, um, there's also the To Me piece, which was by Mel Chen um, in Philadelphia. And for this one, um, people were invited to pose as living monuments in the city hall courtyard in Philadelphia. And so these are some examples of what that looked like. And then lastly, we have some pieces um, from around the state. There's um, the uh, temporary cup of meat installation by Blue Pride in Pack Square Park last year. That's the upper left-hand corner. Um, right next to it is a really cool one. It's called Hoops Playing Hoops. And the great thing about this is that um, if you shoot a basketball into one of the hoops, it's linked by a ramp. So the ball goes through to another one. And the art is really designed to look like um, humans, people playing basketball and passing the ball from one person to another. So it's a great way to take basketball, turn it into something that's interactive and artistic at the same time. Um, Here's My Story is a piece um, that was funded by Z. Smith Reynolds Inclusive Public Art Program. It's another interactive piece. It's got benches uh, that serve as a platform for gathering, connecting, and listening. And it aims to foster a climate where equity and mutual respect are intrinsic by sharing the stories of those local citizens who have been historically marginalized. And you'll be able to find this 
um, in, um, I think it's in Raleigh. Um, looking at my notes here, I can't find that. Um, next to it is Smart Kinston, uh, which is an initiative to create a cultural district, cultural district by housing artists with the relocation program, free open studios, creative place making initiatives, and community arts development. And then lastly, the Under the Silver Moon Lantern Parade included a series of lantern making workshops uh, as part of the GLOW 2021 Outdoor Exhibition, a series of light installations in downtown Cary, North Carolina, which worked to brighten up the evening sky starting in the new year. Um, so these are all different examples of public art and how public art has looked in other places. Uh, but as the first slide said, it's really just public art in public spaces and it can look like anything, whether it's something that's drawn or written or it's a performance piece or whatever. And so that's a good opportunity for us to seg into our panelists for today. So um, we'll look more at the questions, um, but I want to start by having our panelists introduce themselves. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Fox and then ask each person to uh, volunteer the next person uh, to come in after you. So Dr. Fox, please um, introduce yourself and talk about your experience with public art here in Asheville, please. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Joseph Fox. I am the outgoing vice president of the Martin Luther King Jr. Association of Asheville and Buncombe County, uh, retired from the North Carolina Community College system and the owner of, of Fox Management Consulting uh, Enterprises. And so um, I, I do some consulting with Mountain Biz Works. And so I have done business coaching with local artists around the entrepreneurial model for entrepreneurs uh, that are artists. Uh, really got my starting working with artists uh, in Haywood County uh, when I was an instructor of entrepreneurship at uh, Haywood Community College and worked with their professional crafts uh, program where uh, we had all types of artists that had a passion for their production, for their creation, but not the business side of it. So how do you take your passion and your production and turn it into a viable option for cash flow? So that's kind of my my um, re, my relations with public art is working with lo local artists to say you have passion, you have uh, really a value added production. Now let's look at the equity part of getting you established in downtown Asheville. And I'm going to pass it to Marcia. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcia Almodovar. I'm the Community School Partnership Manager for United Way. But my public art in Asheville has been, um, it's been quite a range. Um, I'm on the Public Art and Cultural Commission currently, and we are working on a bunch of different projects, but the Pack Square um, revitalization is one of them. I'm also on the Urban Trail Committee. Um, we helped work on the Black Lives Matter mural, as well as some big public art pieces. I'm also on the board of the Asheville Downtown Association that has allocated funds for some public art pieces, as well as coordinating the easel writer for Leaf Community Arts, which is a children's public art program at different festivals and events and after school programs. Um, and I'm also a local artist myself. So um, yeah, um, there you go, Stephanie. Thanks, Marsha and everybody else. My name is Steph Munson Dahl. I work for the city of Asheville, your local government, or maybe your neighbor's local government. I've worked there for 17 years. So I consider myself at this point an expert in local government, if you have any questions on that. And that's why I'm here today, talk about that, that piece of it. But I have um, a pretty long history in making investments in uh, places that are special to people. And most of my work has been in downtown and in the, the riverfront and especially the River Arts District. I do alongside one of our urban designers, Carly Stevenson, 
provide uh, the staff team that supports our public art program, which includes the Public Art and Cultural Commission and several other elements. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you all today. Thank you, Steph and Dr. Fox and Marsha for those introductions. Um, I'm mostly going to have this flow um, pretty loosely and, um, and, and allow y'all to popcorn uh, responses. However, for this first question, I'd love it if each of you could answer. Uh, it's a two-part question. Um, and Marsha, we'll start with you. Uh, what do you like about Asheville's public art scene and what would you change? There's a lot that I like about Asheville's uh, public art scene. Um, I like that there is one that's kind of, it's robust and people are really, you know, Asheville has a foundation of public art. Um, and you can see it anywhere. What I, um, what I dislike is that um, there needs to be um, maybe a bit more infusion of other sort of cultures more in a broader way. There's a lot of, Eurocentric aesthetic. And I'd like to see that kind of switch up a little bit as well as public art expanded outside of the downtown area. Um, you know, just as we have food deserts, we kind of also have art deserts in certain areas of our community. And I'd like to see more focus on um, having art be in those kinds of areas and it, just a different shift of aesthetic. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, Steph, how about you? What do you like about the scene and what would you like to see different? What I like about the scene is that it actually exists without the support of government, meaning that um, most of the time when people come here and they're like, wow, I went to this place and I saw this amazing X, Y, or Z, it had nothing to do with uh, government supporting it. And what I would, um, so that's great, right? We already have the juice here that's flowing. What I would change about it is exactly that. So I think that um, we need to have support for public art on all levels and more civic sector, which means like a combination of private, public and our institutions working together because it's really the way we express ourselves as a, a community. And so the things that Marsha said are uh, poignant to me and we're gonna get there only with additional cooperation. Her, her. And how about you, Dr. Fox? I would have to say ditto uh, to what has already been said. Um, what I really love is that you can find public art throughout the city of Asheville. Uh, what I would change is the uh, accessibility of it to um, creating a pipeline, I would say, of our youth and our young adults to get them more involved. It seems uh, as, as you go through, there are, um, you know, the, the regular names that you hear when we talk about local artists uh, in, in the Asheville area. So how do we create that pipeline of younger uh, school kids, et cetera, in spaces that are relevant to, to them where it's, it's accessible to all people? That's a good point. And, and actually, it's a very good segue into the next question. So. You know, we've talked about wanting to see diversity in public art, uh, not just in the, uh, in the art that is depicted, but in the artists who are doing the creating of the art. Um, which then leads to the question um, for anyone, um, what can we be doing better to engage um, BIPOC residents um, in, in the art scene, whether it's from being the subjects of art to being the creators of the art? What, what strategies uh, can be employed to uh, increase that diversity? I could go. <laughs> so one of the things that I think um, that we fall into is like this one size fits all community engagement process. And if you want a diverse community and I can like uh, art projects that reflect everyone in the community, you need to have different modalities on reaching 
um, different people, not everyone's computer savvy, you know, having some of this contract language that's, you know, for a seasoned artist can be very daunting, but for newer artists, you know, with, there's a lot of legal binding contracts and some of those bits that can really turn people off of, you know, just being able to engage with the, you know, the, the edge of speak or the jargon or all, you know, the legal binding um, wording of some of these big contracts. And, you know, I understand that there need to be multi layers and all the information in there, but it, they're really hard to read through. Um, and so I think um, that can be a little bit of a barrier. Also um, having these like quick turnaround and timelines. I think that that's a really, you know, disservice to our community because historically BIPOC people, you know, have not been given these opportunities. So, you know, there's other jobs and if you're a single parent and have to work and then you have, you know, three weeks to submit your, you know, your proposal or two weeks, it kind of puts you in a time crunch. And I think if you want a diverse population to apply for some of these, you know, really big projects and, and put their, you know, hat in the ring, you have to widen that timeline and give people that don't have access to all these things or probably a computer and need to go to a public library or need childcare or, you know, can, you know, work on their creative process at night or on weekends. I think having these shortened time frames really limits that big scope of work of community that you can really, you know, be getting a lot of ideas and um, and you know opportunities for everybody. Also, I think one of the things is with that experience piece, you know, with bigger budget projects, um, there's bias to newer artists, you know, that don't have that wide berth of experience. And so they're not counted. There's like a like a, an implicit bias there that already exists. You know, they're newer, they don't have a lot of experience, but it doesn't mean that they can't get the work done, right? And if we talk about engaging BIPOC community, we have to make it equitable. We have to, you know, widen those time frames, you know, widen that, you know, the, the contract language and maybe have it in other languages, you know. Um, have, you know, kind of think of what is our community, what people do we want to engage, and sort of not have this, you know, one size fits all community engagement process, but really specialize the way we look at our applicants and sort of try to eliminate those biases that we come in with, such as, like, you know, I pointed out the experience, the contract language, and these timelines. I think there are real hindrance in getting a wide pool of people applying for, you know, these big public art contracts. So I'm, I'm hearing you say, Marsha, that it's, it's really about making the process itself more accessible, stepping away from how things have traditionally been done, thinking exactly. outside of the box to create something that's a little more responsive to the lived experience of artists that have been marginalized from processes like this, yeah? Yeah, you said that way more eloquent than I did. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, I've That's got to sit and listen to you talk about it, so. <laughs> also, you know, we come in with, with, with biases all the time. Like, you know, we have, you know, our ageism and our ableism. And so we, you know, we, we show up, you know, without those things. And I think some of these key pieces are really hindering the, what we could see our community produce, especially if we want a reflection of everyone in the community. We do have to broaden our horizons and that takes time and we have to allow for people to access and take the time to do those things if we truly want to, you know, work in that sort of, you know, mind frame. Thank you for that. Steph uh, and, and Dr. Fox, I know that you both have worked with groups of artists, Steph through the city and previous uh, calls for artists and Dr. Fox, as you mentioned, working with artists that um, at the educational level, um, what sort of input do y'all have around um, engaging, meaningfully engaging a larger and more diverse population, specifically of Black and Brown artists? I'll go first and I'll say first, Vera, I'm here in listening mode and I've been listening to some of these panels to make sure that I'm learning because, right, I'm in this position of privilege and power at the city to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to hire people. So I'm listening. I really uh, I want to piggyback off this time thing that Marsha brought up. So 
we keep hearing this and it's something that I think um, is important to note for all of my colleagues as well is that it's not just the time to respond to the process, but we don't have relationships within the community that foster creating that kind of, um, the kind of art that really reflects our total community. So we're, we're um, you know, I hate using the word transactional because I actually think that sometimes transactional can be a good thing, um, but it is, uh, people understand, people understand the bad part of it. So I'll use that, right? So it's really easy for me to be like plop, here's a call for artists, respond, fill out the form, and then we're gonna review you and rank you and, and all this, and I don't even know you. And I haven't spent any time in your community. And it's crazy to think that I would be able to get um, people I've never met before who might live totally different lives than me to respond to something that is completely formed through my cultural lens. So, so that part of it, you know, and, and so that part of it is really interesting. And then, so relationships, I, I heard um, uh, Dwayne said last week, it's really important for us to hear this too, is like the infrastructure that we need to build. So the, that network and those relationships, but also the training um, that's the onus is, uh, you know, Katie from the Arts Council and I are talking about it, like the onus is on us to figure some of that out and to, to um, whether we lead or we support, but to be there and to help make that happen. Um, it, uh, why not? Why wouldn't we help people figure out how to do that? That just seems um, really interesting to me. And then the last thing I'll just bring up is that, um, how about, how about providing opportunities that are actually either in communities that people are in, you know, or are relevant to them thematically. So that's another part of this kind of, you know, coming from a white lens where we, you know, let those of us that are, that are um, look more like me really need to stop and think about uh, how we're providing opportunities and if they're going to be of interest to people of color. Thank you. Dr. Fox. Yeah, and I, I would just piggyback off of, of both of those um, comments and say that, uh, that, that I was having two, two thoughts here going on. And one is, you know, as, as the city uh, put out bids and things, being more creative around how that messaging is getting out to communities of color. Uh, you know, and, and not just the city, but we're, as a society, we're bad about just thinking, uh, if we put it on our website, people will find it. And so we, we've got to find diverse channels of getting that messaging out and, and, and really branding that message where it is a value to uh, artists of color black and brown artists uh, to say this this piece is something that you can reflect your culture with etc so the the messaging around the branding the uh diverse communication channels and social media uh that we're using to get the information out not just putting it on the website and then from the data analytical piece really backing into what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So, you know, starting with a question similar to uh, what would downtown Asheville, Asheville's public art scene look like um, if diverse artists had full access to resources to contribute their vision, vision to downtown. And, and then really thinking about what are the outcomes that we are hoping to achieve with public art. And then how do we apply an equity lens for access, resource sharing, and participation of black and brown artists uh, in building the system? So really kind of looking at the outcomes that we want and back into what are the challenges that are facing black and brown artists and how do we uh, eliminate those challenges to answer the question of what would it look like downtown Asheville if our diverse artist communities had full access? What, what would that mean? And what would it take us to get there? Heard, heard. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Fox. 
And um, Steph, you mentioned this and, and, and all of your responses um, have sort of teased this a little bit, um, but there's the comment that uh, Duane made at one of last week's session, um, which you know is consistent with the fact that a couple of years ago, we saw this shift um, begin with a lot of um, uh, organizations wanting to be more equitable. Um, a lot of it was in response to what was happening, um, what had been happening for a while, but you know, certain events like uh, George Floyd um, brought a lot of attention to the inequities and the injustice that was still taking place. And as a result, people have been more demonstrative and at least more vocal in their desire to be more equitable. Um, and so Duane's comment was similar to saying, hey, for a while, things are moving in slow motion, and now everything is moving really, really fast. And as you we were saying, Steph, the infrastructure, the, the communities themselves aren't always ready to respond to this outpouring of interest, this outpouring of support. So, you know, my question then is, um, what strategies do you think um, should be used to better engage communities in this process with the mind to the fact that they're still adapting, they're still adjusting, they're still dealing with the fact that funders, for example, that may have never considered giving grants to communities for these kinds of arts are now tripping over themselves to give out these grants to, um, uh, to communities and to artists and for different kinds of purposes. And now it's like, how do you get the engagement that you want before they say, well, we tried to reach out to people and nobody responded. So now we're gonna just go back and do it what we did before. Oof. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so you want me to start with that one? I didn't know if sure, Marcia, sure. you looked like you might have some thoughts on it too, so. You know, I always have thoughts on things, but. <laughs> um, so, I'm just going to say something, then I'm going to ask Marsha to talk. So I, I'm I'm thinking about it because I'm trying to I'm trying to actually put a name on that bucket. I don't know, you know, I don't want to label everything, but there's there's something to do with capacity building in there, um, uh, and uh, you know, I think it's a multi pronged approach. But I'll just say this one piece about it. I'm a big fan of that resources matter and that money is just one resource, right? So what we're kind of talking about too is that like you have you have potential for money to be flood flooding in, but what you don't have are those other resources of like expertise or people who have time. Time is an enormous resource. And so the strategies I think I would be interested in hearing from other people, because again, hearing mode, it's like, how can we create time? How can we create, <laughs> keep, seriously? Yeah, yeah. How, how can, um, how can we slow, yeah, if we literally, he, Dwayne said, let's slow this down, right? And, and um, there's gotta be ways for us to think about slotting things differently or, um, with the people that I want to be engaging with, they're very, very busy people. And when money is flooding in, it means that now they're three times as more busy, right? Like those same. So part of it is saying we have got to look at, there are plenty of other people here who are talented. So that's one of our, our resources or assets. You know, how are we building the capacity there? But um, Marsha has actual expertise in this, so... No, I don't know if I have expertise in anything, but I do have <laughs> opinions about a lot of things. So, you know, one of the things is that I, I completely agree. So, you know, a lot of people that have worked in racial equity, or if you've just grown up as a person of color, you know, this is something that, you know, you've, you've been striving for and, you know, kind of running, running this race. And then all of a sudden, you know, because we're at home and we're staying at our, camp, our TVs, not doing anything at that time of the pandemic, it sort of was like this in your face. And then it was like, oh, we're here. We're here to like save the day. And that's what it kind of feels like. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of, you know, these predominantly white art community, I mean, a lot of different, but we're just focusing on art today, you know, organizations and community that, you know, it's, you know, the way it is, you know, in our country and Western, it's like, we want to fix it. We recognize and let's go ahead and solve this now. Let's not take the time that it takes 
to really solve these inherent issues. So it's, it feels almost, um, you know, like hiring a swath of people of color or having, you know, these requests for proposals for just BIPOC people and, you know, having these grants that goes to a certain community. If, you know, I, I love it, love to see it, want to see it all day, but it also has this like sort of saviorism feel to it in a bit. And, um, you know, we've had these issues for hundreds of years and we can't fix this on a grant application and, you know, just this allocation of funds and have that immediate satisfaction. And, you know, and I think our society is so focused on the product and what is being produced and what, you know, we could put on our website and what we can check off and our diversity benchmarks, but we're not taking the time to, you know, educate our staff. Yes, I do believe that, you know, organizations, you know, big organizations as the Arts Council and, you know, other, you know, there's plenty that can allocate funds towards those educational pieces for people of color. Like, how do you write your bio, your website? some of those educational bits, but I don't think the onus is on that. I think the responsibility is for these organizations to actually do robust implicit bias training, robust racial equity work, really understand the, you know, the actions and, you know, the cause and why we are here and take the time to learn how to really have the dialogue, really have the communication and, you know, two things can be done at once. So there can be, you know, an outpouring of funds and a reach out for artists of color and BIPOC artists. And there needs to be the educational component. And it's not just once a month and it's not once a quarter. This has to be ongoing structural systemic change if you want to really change the way we view our culture, our society, our country. So it has to be much more long-term then, you know, I put this statement on my website and I'm offering a $500 grant. Why is nobody applying? It's because I don't trust you. And this is not historic in the way things go and definitely not in this town. So we need to look at some of those things and really take the time that it's going to take to understand the root causes of these issues in order to see things spring forward in the way that, you know, as a society, is the most beneficial. And there's nothing that does that more than intentional time. Thank you so much for that, Marsha. And, and Dr. Fox, I'd love to hear uh, any input from you. And it just, it, it sounds to me that what is important to remember here uh, is a phrase that I've, I heard a long time ago um, in um, community engagement, community organizing, community moves at the speed of trust. Right. Um, and the more that people trust you, the more that they're willing to work with you and the more engaged they're going to be in the process. And it feels like what's needed here, um, in addition to, like Steph was saying, multiple resources. So in addition to the funding um, that is coming through, the relationships need to be built. Um, and a lot of times people will say, oh, I'm doing this thing and I need to get the word out to these BIPOC artists that I've never worked with before. I've never done anything. I don't know what their lived experience is like, but I want them to take advantage of this opportunity because it's good for them, but mostly because it's good for me as well. Um, and so sort of stepping, it feels like, you know, there's a need to step out of that. You know, Dr. Fox, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what is your experience be and what uh, what insight can you bring from, from that experience uh, that can be helpful in this process? Oh, I agree 100% with everything that has been said thus far. And I was actually moving around my computer here trying to find a little sticky uh, note that uh, I used for a similar presentation recently around community engagement. And so these were some things I had jotted down just a few weeks ago around just community engagement. So as we're having funding sources and moving at the, uh, you know, the this quick and pace, how do we provide access to these communities for their input? You know, we're, we're throwing money at folks, but is it uh, being thrown at the right areas? Is it being, is it a value? So how do we get that input from the community that we're reaching out to? Uh, how do we build that trust that Marsha just talked about um, and have open and honest dialogue 
around the needs of our black and brown artists. So, mm -hmm. you know, the savior complex, how can, you know, we're running in, throwing money behind the scenes, but are we really providing the wraparound services or the access that artists need? Do we have a resource area where if they don't have the space to be creative, that there we can provide as part of this grant money um, a space for them to share and come together and, and work? Um, how do we uh, encourage full participation? Again, not the same artists that typically rise uh, rises to the top, but folks that we no don't normally reach out to. Uh, and, and again, what are our sources, our diverse sources of communication to get information out to, to people? Are we using the urban news? Are we using WRES? Are we using uh, Aisha Adams and uh, the Asheville View? Are we putting stuff in uh, the MLK Association monthly e-newsletter? Uh, but having those, creating those pathways that encourage and build trust before we start trying to go into communities and solve issues with just uh, grant money. Thank you, thank you for that. So as we talk about how to engage um, a more diverse community and specifically um, BIPOC artists in various public art projects, uh, it's important to note that there's several of them that are taking place in town right now, uh, including a couple that were mentioned already from the revisioning of Pat Plaza to the African American Heritage Trail. Um, we talked a little bit about um, strategies for engaging more diversity um, in the process. What are some of the pitfalls that, um, that might not have already been named in your responses that uh, should be avoided in these processes if we want to make sure that we are getting more diverse engagement from um, Black and Brown artists? Thanks, Marshall. Uh, it's the Marshall Show. <laughs> always, Seku. All Marsha, all the time. Um, I think some of the, the pitfalls is uh, not having, um, if we want BIPOC representation and we aren't, want the art to reflect that, I think some of the people that, um, you know, some of the decision makers need to be people of color, the leading artists need to be, you know, BIPOC people. Um, you know, there is, I think that needs to, you know, that phrase, nothing for us without us. I think that that applies to public art. You just really need to have, you know, BIPOC people in charge of those projects and leading those projects and having, you know, that voice be at the center and then allocating those sort of responsibilities, you know, elsewhere. I think that's really important. Um, but having, you know, more diverse boardrooms and reflective of committees and um, really, you know, recruiting. And like I said, a lot of those pieces take time, but I really do feel like um, that, like people of color really need to lead some of those projects and, and have that voice. Steph from previous, yeah, it, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Foss, please continue. Well, and, and I'll, I'll lean into, uh, on that also a little bit. You know, I, I reflect, um, for a number of years, I, I worked with uh, an organization called North Carolina Rural Entrepreneurship Through Action Learning. And we uh, also did a lot of work uh, with crafters, uh, et cetera. But one of the things, one of the products that came out of that program at, at one time was entrepreneur towns and cities. And it was a real focus around, uh, you know, I'm here in Black Mountain and uh, Black Mountain is one of those entrepreneur cities. Um, and I was on that, that committee that helped foster that, that spirit. But one of the products was a, a, a tool that came out 
that for any entrepreneur trying to do business in these local towns that were entrepreneur cities, it was a resource guide that shared all types of resources of what it takes to be a successful business owner. If we could create something like that for our local BIPOC artists that says, uh, you know, here are some sources of resources, here are some community shared spaces. This is the process for bidding on, on projects. Here's a number for uh, if you have questions. Here are child care providers that can provide child care as a small price so that you have time devoted to production. But creating a more strategic approach of support and wraparound services for our BIPOC community and artists. That, I, I, you mentioned some very, very good things in that response, Dr. Fox. Thank you for that. And, and so Steph, it's got me wondering, what is the capacity for the city to have um, like a support artist, um, a, su a support office, if you will? I, I think about um, like minority business or women-owned business, right? Mm -hmm. There's in, within the city, within most cities, there's a department and they can provide to women entrepreneurs and to minority business owners, many of those types of resources that Dr. Fox just mentioned. Oh, you need someone to help you with your proposal writing, go here. You need someone for some childcare, you need someone to help you with incubator space or whatever it is, all of that. But if you're an artist, where can you go to get that kind of information and that kind of support? around being more included in and being more ready to be included in these public art uh, opportunities? Well, it's just a matter of prioritizing things, right? There's always the, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, I wanna say that there are some incredible resources at the city and maybe they're just not coordinated yet. So um, we of course have the Asheville Business Inclusion Office and, um, while um, Rosanna Mulcahy left and she was amazing, um, we now have Angelica Driver in that seat and she is also amazing. And, and I know she's interested in these types of things. Um, we, we, we don't have the capacity, honestly, to create some kind of grand office that is gonna focus solely on this because that's just the way local government works as you know, shoestrings, something like that. Um, but like I said, if we can, you know, if we can, we, we do great when we like, when we coordinate interdepartmental teams, that's, that's how we're going to get stuff done. So, um, and also it's about the people, right? So um, one of the things that I think in the story of Asheville and how we've looked at um, uh, BIPOC engagement in public art, we had Brenda Mills, who's like our, our, who's leading, you know, um, our equity office now, who served, and she's done a thousand jobs here. And one of the things she did was when the public art program kind of fell apart at one time fiscally, um, uh, and that's a whole other conversation that kind of feeds into this or whatever. She took on not only being what was then the minority business program manager, but also being the public art um, program manager. And she was able to kind of meld some of those things together. And it was under her leadership that originally the Public Art and Cultural Commission were able to come up with the idea that we needed to do um, what became the Celebrating African Americans Through Public Art Project. So there's some assets there. And um, in partnership, this is the other thing, again, I'll go back to what I said in the beginning is the city can't, city can't do these things alone. Those, those, I'm not sure if there ever were days like that, but if there were, those days are long gone. Everything is about public-private partnerships. So the more that we can be working with the Arts Council, who's done an incredible job the last couple of years, especially under um, Katie's leadership, um, trying to figure some of these things out for us and do like, even if it's not all out on paper, but mapping what we've got, you know, and um, and many of the other organizations in the area, we we can um, we can provide that we can create that. But it's also going to take people going to www.ashevillenc.gov and actually opening that web page. Mm -hmm. So there's there's also some of that we got to talk about. Indeed, indeed. 
Thank you for that response, Dr. I love the possibility of some of those things that you suggested, Dr. Joseph, and what mm -hmm. an amazing like output and imagine the things that we could see if we had some of these resources and partnerships together along with the city to provide that for artists of color. I think that would be magnificent. Be yeah, I think about you know where, where my office is located uh, at the Eddington Center. Um, there is a room that is occupied by the STEP program from maybe tech. And it's a great place for folks in the community to come uh, have access to a computer. If you need to search for a job, if you need to type up a resume, if you want to do some online classes, learn about scholarships or learn about educational opportunities at AB Tech right here in the community. So you don't have to go very far to do that. Having some place like that for artists that have the same mm -hmm. sort of resources where you just pop in, there's somebody there. So what kind of work do you do? Oh, uh, I'm a sculptor. Oh, great. Here's resources for sculptors. Do you know this or whatever? So something like that would really, really be great. Were you going to say something, Dr. Fox? Yeah, I was going to say we have to be creative around funding also. And so, you know, right now with the pandemic, there's all kind of funding out there around mental health. So why not use mental health funding or funding that part of money around encouraging expression through art? So, you know, we, we have to be very entrepreneur. You know, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So we have to be very entrepreneurial around how we even approach uh, resources for uh, our BIPOC artists. So not just tying it to art, but just some of the, the mental health issues that can be alleviated through self-expression with painting, et cetera. Absolutely. Now you're talking my language because I'm a big um, advocate of the arts and, um, and their impact in addressing the social determinants of health. Um, and, and I also am strongly um, uh, a believer of bringing the financial aspect into the arts. That's just going to make it work. Like, like I said, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. And I think a lot of times there are situations where people are just so focused on the art they neglect the, the commercial piece of it. And yeah, say what you want about capitalism and commercialism, it's not always our friend. However, when you work it in the right way, it can be a beneficial component of being a sustainable artist as opposed to a starving artist. And I think most people would rather be a sustainable artist than a starving artist, yeah? Um, we do have some questions um, from, the, um, from the audience that I want to get to in a moment. But before we do that, the last thing I wanted to ask our panelists um, were, um, was what public art projects are not happening that should be considered? Uh, are there really uh, wonderful ideas, either in some of the things we saw in the beginning, uh, examples from other cities, or things that you just may have heard about? Um, in your travels or your work that, oh, this would be a perfect thing or a great idea for Asheville to uh, examine as a public art piece. And any of you that might think of anything. I've actually thought about, um, there's not enough um, indigenous representation. You know, we're in the Eastern band of Cherokee and there's not an, I don't feel like that is represented in our city and our town. And there's some amazing things that have happened. You know, it's not too far away from you know the the where our the principal, the president of the Cherokee Nation lives. And you know, I think inviting some of the, that conversation and seeing some of that representation would be amazing. And sort of how it flows with um, with our with our BIPOC community. And if we truly mean BIPOC, that includes you know the Eastern Band of Cherokee Nation. And I think that. Um, we need to kind of see that and feel it and live amongst that more. And also, as I mentioned before, there seems to be like a public art desert as there are some food deserts in our communities on the outskirts of, you know, uh, downtown, like, you know, Deaver, uh, Deaver View or Louisiana and all these other areas that I think would really benefit in many different ways, mental health and community pride and, you know, all these different things if there were more public art projects focused and engaging community and where they're at and bringing public art in spaces where people actually live without having to worry about transportation and different pieces 
of coming and doing the stuff downtown and more touristy vis vis you know, visible locations, but having public art really permeate throughout all of Lincoln County and our community. Great comments, great comments. Staff, Dr. Fox, any things that you think would be um, worth considering and adding to what we're doing public art wise in the area? The, the one that pops into my mind is a celebration of women. Uh, our MLK Association right now is doing our Rosa Parks uh, awards, et cetera. And, you know, typically you see people like uh, Dr. King statues in, in almost every city's. But uh, from a gender point of view, where, where are our female warriors and, and how do we celebrate the accomplishments uh, that they have uh, brought to us? And, and I echo what Marcia said, because that was my first thought was our, our first people, our Native Americans, our uh, uh, individual uh, Cherokees, et cetera. And then just a community tied to community history. So, you know, Asheville, uh, particularly the Cherokee Nation, uh, the railroad system coming through here, and the individuals that Dr. Dan Pierce at UNC Asheville is researching that uh, were killed uh, building the railroad system through Western North Carolina, and particularly as it came up Old Fort and into um, Asheville. Uh, you know, recently they found uh, unmarked graves where. Uh, folks were arrested, mainly African-American males, and put the work on the railroad system and just buried along the, the tracks. And so recognizing that part of our history also. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to answer your question by answering a different question. So I'm going to go back to, because uh, they did a great job of saying, well, hey, what, what are some of the kinds of public art that we could be seeing here? If there was something that we could be doing in our community that's not happening or on public art right now, I want to go back to this thing about elevating this. Thank you, Dr. Fox, for this. Elevating the use of public art and placemaking in our communities to actually solve mental health issues, to look at our ecologies, and to not consider it. This is the main thing. I'm going to get angry, but it's not fluff. It's public art is, is not some kind of extraneous thing that we just get to, you know, that we should think about funding or having people do after all, you know, the other basic needs are met. We can address basic needs through investments in um, expressions of history and culture that are meaningful to people in, in place. So I, th I think we as a community need to get there. We, we need to sell people. Um, what Dr. Fox was saying with this, this money that's out there, we need to sell people on the idea that that money, it's worthwhile to invest in, in public art and placemaking. Agreed, agreed. Thank you, thank you. So we have some questions from um, members of the audience. Um, and one of the questions is about what permits are required for placing a mural on the front of a building uh, that, is, that they own on French Broad Avenue. Uh, Steph, you might want to... Probably none. The quick oh. answer is as long as it doesn't advertise anything commercially, and we can talk about what that means literally, but um, if you're going to put scaffolding up, if you need to put scaffolding up, yeah, we want to make sure that's that's safe and you're going to be blocking the sidewalk. We have a couple of little, we have a sidewalk closure permit, those types of things, but we do not regulate um, murals unless they are signs. But again, safety stuff, yeah, we got to get some, a couple little permits. Okay, okay, that's good to know. And uh, we have two questions that are somewhat similar. They're related to engagement. Um, one is um, a question about reaching a BIPOC community with a photography call to artists for an upcoming exhibition, specifically the LGBTQIA BIPOC community. Um, and then the other is um, a mural project downtown if folks want to get the word out to local community, where do local artists look to find those opportunities? How would you all respond to individuals who have some opportunities that they want to share with this community? What can they do today, right now, to get the word out to people who might be interested? Dr. Fox had a bunch of great ideas earlier. There was like a bunch of publications from the 
urban news, Hola Carolina. Um, there's like a lot of publications of you know people of color as well as you know the Arts Council as well as um, not only, but I would go outside of the box of just using digital platforms. I would, you know, have some flyers, go to, you know, community meetings, go to where people are at. I hear that a lot. Like, we don't have enough people of color at this event or, you know, involved in this. And it's like, how many times do you go to, you know, a, the Eddington Center or, you know, to events at Burton Street or, you know, so show up, make friends, authentically engage without transactional relationships. And, you know, then you'll meet, you know, people of you know, the people that you want to engage with. But I think thinking outside of just posting on job boards and using the internet as one modality to have multiple diverse ways of accessing communities and authentically be engaged in what people are doing as well. And, you know, just making sure it's not just one-sided, yeah, um, yeah. you know. So. Thank you, thank you. Um, Steph, Dr. Fox, any thoughts? I don't have it. I, I don't have anything that hasn't been already said. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Um, and the other, the other um, source that we sometimes forget is faith-based organizations. Um, and so reaching out to those and any other community-based organization and association um, that you can you can think of. And, and a lot of times we forget our educational systems. Uh, you know, I, I just did a, a training for some HR folks and you know, they were talking about recruiting and retaining um, individuals of color uh, for our labor market. And, you know, they make the mistake sometimes of reaching out to the HR people, to the top, you know. A lot of times they are not the ones connected to the, the boots on the ground. And so I said, well, how about looking at a college's website and finding the student clubs that fits what you're trying to do? So what are the diverse groups on uh, various campuses that might have an interest in what you're trying to do? And how do you pull those folks in? So being, again, as Marcia said, thinking outside of the box and being very creative with diverse strategies. And, and if you're not, um, you know, if, you, if that's not your, your uh, paradigm, finding folks in the communities that can connect you to various diverse networks. And that's kind of where you start building some trust. Um, I'm doing some work right now with a couple of educational attainment groups. And, you know, there are some places I can show up and folks will follow me. But there's other places that I can show up and they're not. So I reach back into the community and people that I know that have inroads into those groups that I don't have enrolled to. And I'll say, would you go or go with me as I talk about the importance of faster completion or whatever it is? Why not? Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have one more question and I think it's probably going to be a staff question. Um, <clears throat> so um, we got props for lots of good ideas and conversation. Addressing the piecemeal system seems short-sighted. Uh, is there a conversation around a city and county multi-year plan to create a comprehensive approach for these needs? We know the city and the county are always putting together uh, five-year, 10-year, 20-year plans. Um, to your knowledge, in what ways are uh, public art strategies um, being addressed in these plans? Okay, that's like five questions. Um... So let me start off by saying there is a desire and the Public Art and Cultural Commission at the city has been um, advocating this for several years to have a joint like Buncombe County Cultural Arts Master Plan that would help us pull out all, everything that all these other adopted plans say, but also kind of update some of those plans and get an idea of like where are our priorities as a community. And that would help us understand, like, should we help with an artist resource center? Should, you know, should we be funding a specific kind of public art program? And, you know, those conversations, 
if the answer is, are there conversations happening? Yeah, there's conversations happening and they've been happening for years, but again, got to prioritize things right now. Um, we don't have the resources to put that together and we're hoping that we do. I don't want to be negative about it. I want us to feel positive that we can come forward and, um, and figure out a way to, to do this together for sure. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we've, we've reached the end. Um, and um, before the final closing remarks, I'd like to ask each of you to very, very quickly just um, share with the audience what you're up to right now um, and how they can reach you to learn more about your work. Uh, so, Marsha, we'll start with you. What are you up to these days and how can folks get in touch with you? I am working um, <laughs> and being a parent, <laughs> um, so that's where I'll be, but um, it's um, on a local community board near you, but with the Public Art Commission, uh, for sure, on some of the projects, and I'm also um, in talks of uh, developing my own show of my own personal art that won't probably be ready for maybe this summer, I'm hoping, um, you know, but yeah, I don't have much information on that. I have some preliminary meetings coming up. I just kind of want to really wrap my head around what that's going to look like, but I will um, try to do all those modes of <laughs> getting the word out like we talked about earlier for that. Um, but thank you. I really enjoyed our discussion today and I appreciate you guys having me on the panel. Right on. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, Dr. Fox, what, um, what exciting things are you up to these days and, and how can our viewers at home catch up with you when they need to? Well, I, I, I have a couple things that are, are going on um, with the Land of Sky Collaborative, which is landofskycollaborative.org. Uh, we are really trying to engage the community around educational attainment that leads to gainful employment. And that can be short-term credentials through content education, where a person can come in and get a short-term, I mean, really like a two-week certification to drive a forklift. And actually that certification is even shorter and tying that to gainful employment. Um, and we're reaching out to communities of color around faster completion, around getting students uh, of color into early college and middle college programs uh, in the four county region of Land of Sky. With the MLK Association, we've just finished our historical marker uh, installation of the three individuals that were lynched in Buncombe County. We are working with Reverend Tammy Forte Logans to set up a three-part series of community healing workshops for um, people of color. And we're planning a trip to the museums uh, in Montgomery for uh, late April, early March, June, depending on, on COVID numbers. And um, the only other thing I would say is I continue to do business coaching for any of our local entrepreneurs through uh, Mouth and Biz work. Beautiful, thank you, thank you. And Steph, what's, uh, what action, exciting things are going on at the city? <laughs> well, let's see. Um, one of the things that I want folks to know is uh, that our, we are working with the Public Art and Cultural Commission to develop a temporary public art program for uh, PAC Square. And we're gonna ask people to answer a couple of questions through their art. And we'll be like, what should this area look and feel like in the future in order for it to be a more um, equitable and inclusive place? And also asking what stories um, are we not seeing and what stories haven't been told down here? So we're, we're crafting that right now. We're hoping to release that in the beginning of April and have our first work up in, May and roll that out through the rest of the year. We have a larger um, uh, uh, 
a project around re-envisioning PAC Square. And then I think you can go to AshevilleNC.gov backslash PAC Square. And I think Katie was putting some of these in here, Katie and Hannah. Also AshevilleNC.gov backslash public art is where you can go to learn about some cool new calls for artists. We just put one out uh, yesterday or two days ago for the Broadway Public Safety Station. If you haven't heard about that project, it's this beautiful new like three-story LEED certified fire and police and community room building that um, the community has been working with um, folks at the city for a while. And there's uh, an award of about $84,000 for someone who can um, provide some public art, one or more pieces in the area that really align with the ethos that those public safety, um, um, public safety and public servants uh, exemplify. So, um, and you can, so there's a lot of stuff on the city's website there. And we're also, um, I'm personally um, just starting my journey I'm trying to create relationships, um, but first better understanding the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Understand before I go traipsing along, how about understanding that a little bit better first and maybe going and visiting more often and that type of thing. So uh, lots to come, lots of good stuff this year. Great, great. Well, thank you, Steph. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Thank you, Marsha, for your time um, and your uh, your energy and your uh, your wisdom uh, and your conversation is all very um, enlightening uh, to, to, to be a part of. Uh, I would also like to thank um, all of you who joined us for the event, especially those of you who are still here. Uh, a video recording will be posted at AshevilleArts.com slash protest either today or tomorrow. And of course, we want to thank once again uh, our sponsors, Dogwood Health Trust, Asheville Area Arts Council, Martin Luther King Jr. Association of Nashville, Buffalo County, and Equity Over Everything. Please make sure you've checked the links for, I mean, check the chat for links that have been put there. Um, and thanks once again for joining us. We really appreciate having you today. Um, and we will see everybody soon. Take Thank care you, and have you. a wonderful day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you.